Well, tonight we're going to be closing our Fallen series that we've been going through the last three weeks. And we've been going through Genesis chapter 3 for three weeks. And we've looked at how in the beginning of time, God created the whole world. He created everything. And after He created everything, He looks at everything and He says, it is good. In fact, it's very good. But when we turn to Genesis chapter 3 and what we've been looking at the last three weeks, we found that everything that was good goes completely bad. Everything falls apart because Adam and Eve sinned. They did the very thing that God told them not to do. Now, tonight, our message is titled, The Fall's Consequences and Cure. We're going to be talking about three consequences of the fall and we're going to be talking at the end about the cure. Now, I got a question for you guys uh, to start us off tonight. Has anybody else in here ever been uh, punished or disciplined by your parents with hot sauce? Anybody else? Am I the only person in here? Wow. I guess nobody. Okay. I was like, am I the only one that was abused as a young child? Uh, <laughs> but anyways... Uh, if, you, if you couldn't already tell this by just like hearing me talk, uh, I was a smart aleck when I was a child. I was the type of kid that wouldn't just take things for what they were from my parents. I would always have to argue and I'd always have to, to say something back to them. I was just the type of kid that would just have a motor mouth and just say the stupidest things. And sometimes, if you notice, I still do say stupid things. So if I say something stupid at night, forgive me, okay? But anyways, as a young kid, I'd always say dumb things. How my dad oftentimes would discipline me when I was young is he would take, does anybody, anybody know, not Tabasco sauce, but Tapatio? Anybody in here ever have Tapatio? Tapatio is good, but Tapatio is not good when you take a very large spoon that's like, you know, this big and you fill the whole thing up with Tapatio sauce and you got to literally drink the whole thing. And so oftentimes what happened was I'd smart off to my dad or to my parents and he'd say, Josh, Tapatio sauce is happening right now. And obviously I'm crying, like, Dad, no, Dad, no, Dad, no. He kicks my head back, you know, claps my nose. And is like, all right, shoves it down my throat. Now, after every time, you know, my mouth would just be on fire. Like, I'd just be like, oh, my gosh, oh, my gosh. And so what I'd always do is, is I'd take a big glass of water and I'd swig it down afterwards. And for those of you that don't know, if you have a lot of heat in your mouth or have had a lot of hot sauce in your mouth, water actually makes it worse. It actually makes all the spices uh, spread throughout your mouth. I didn't know this as a kid. I was stupid. So I would always drink the water and it'd make it worse. It wouldn't make it better. And that was how my dad disciplined me. But now in hindsight, I know that if you actually drink milk when you've had a lot of hot sauce in your mouth or heat in your mouth, that's actually what cures the terribleness going on in your mouth. Now today we're going to be talking about the consequences of the fall. Because just like when I was little and I did something wrong, I had consequences for it. You also have consequences because of the sin that you have in your life. I have consequences in my life because of the sin that I've committed. But luckily we don't have to be like how dumb I was when I was eight and drank water with the hot sauce in my mouth. Each of us in here have a cure that is available for us, even though we all have consequences for the wrong things that we have done. And so we're going to be talking about three consequences, and then at the end we're going to be wrapping up with the cure. But before we hit all those points, let's pray together. Will you guys bow your heads with me? And as I pray, uh, you don't have to, but if you want to, maybe just as a way of just saying, God, I'm open to hearing what you have to say to me tonight. Maybe you could just kind of open up your hands to heaven and just keep them on your lap and just have that as a way of you just saying, God, I'm here. I'm ready to just be open to what you want to speak to me tonight. So let's pray together. Jesus, I thank you so much for these people in this, in this room. Lord, I thank you uh, that, that, that you love each person in this room, that you have something to say to each person in this room. And God, I know um, that you just care about each person in this room and that you want them to hear from you. So God, I ask that they would hear from you and that people would draw closer to you during this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, 
So the first consequence of the fall, the first consequence of sin is pain. The first consequence of the fall is pain. Adam and Eve, they commit the first sin in the history of humanity. And here's what God says to Adam and Eve after they commit the very first sin. This is what God says to Eve. Genesis 3.16 says, To the woman he said, I will make your pains in childbearing very severe. With painful labor, you will give birth to children. Okay? Here's what he says to the man. Now he turns to Adam, and this is what God says to Adam after the first sin. Verses 17 through 18, he says, To Adam he said, Because you listened to your wife and ate the fruit from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil you will eat food from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. Now, ladies, I just got to give you some credit here. You're tougher than us, okay? God says you are going to have painful childbearing. And for the guy, he's just like, well, gardening's going to be hard. You got a few thorns and thistles. So, ladies, uh, just credit to you. You are uh, tougher than us. Uh, you're better than us. But the reason why actually God says, says these uh, specific things to Adam and Eve after the first sin is because the very first thing that God says to Adam and Eve, the first commands he gives them after they're created, is he says, make babies. He says, go and be fruitful and multiply. And then he says, take care of the earth. So what God's basically saying is, is the two things I told you to do in the beginning, because you've sinned, the consequences. It's going to be painful to do those things now. It's going to be hard to do those things now. So what this means is, is that all the pain in your life is a result of sin. If there was not sin in the world, there would be no pain in the world. I'll say that again. All pain in the world is a result of sin. I remember I was eight years old. And uh, I don't remember what I was angry about with my parents, but I was angry with my parents. Um, and so I decided to run away. I, I packed my bags. I got all my stuff stuffed into uh, my sleeping bag. I put on the heaviest coat I could possibly find, even though I'm pretty sure it was the middle of the summer. But, you know, you just never know when you run away. So I put the heaviest coat on. I book it down the street. And uh, eventually, you know, like every other eight-year-old, I chickened out and didn't actually run away, came back home. But just imagine with me for a second that instead of coming back home as an eight-year-old eight, -year, eight -year -old boy back to my parents' house, if I had actually like legitimately ran away and did not return to my parents' house. Like, uh, first of all, that's dumb because as an eight-year-old, you can't take care of yourself. Like, you, I mean, at least for me, I couldn't even pour a, a glass of my own cereal. Like, that's just how special I was back then. Like, you can't, you can't take care of yourself. You don't, you don't know all the different intricacies about life. And so just imagine, imagine this with me for a second. I run away. I don't come back. What happens to me as an eight-year-old? Only God knows, right? I don't know uh, where to go to do things. I don't know how to take care of myself. It would have caused me a lot of pain if I hadn't returned home. Now, the essence of sin is kind of similar to running away from home. Every time you sin, it's as if you are turning your back on God, running away from Him, running away from home, and going out and doing your own thing. And every time you do that, it's going to cause you pain. It's going to cause you pain. Every ounce of pain that is in this world is a result of sin because when you sin it's as if you're running away from home and when you run away from home you don't get taken care of like you should and you end up experience, experiencing pain. Now there are two main reasons why we experience pain today and why you experience pain today in your life. The first has to do with Adam and Eve's sin. The second has to do with your own sin. Okay, the first one's a lot harder, so we're going to tackle that one first. Adam and Eve's sin caused pain for the whole world. Okay, just like I said earlier, God created the world flawless. It was perfect. There was no pain when God created the world. Adam and Eve sin. They separate themselves from God. What happens to the world? Everything is broken. 
The weather is broken. Bodies are broken and there are diseases. All right, that's why nothing works perfectly today. Websites don't work perfectly. Have you ever noticed, by the way, when you're like needing something last minute, that just happens to be the time like something crashes, yeah. right? It's the whole reason why there is pain in this world, why life is so hard. I don't know this biblically, but I'm pretty sure that's like where hard tests came from too, okay? I'm just saying, okay? But really, there is pain in the world because of what Adam and Eve did in their first sin. It caused this whole world to go down into a place that it wasn't originally created for. Now, you might be thinking, well, that's not fair. I have to inherit all the garbage because Adam and Eve did something wrong. Like, they did something bad, and now I have to experience pain because of that. Like, that does not seem fair to me, God. Like, you're kidding me. But in reality, it is kind of fair because really, would you do any better than them? Answer, no, you wouldn't because you sin every day. I sin every day. It wouldn't have been any different if it was you or anybody else that was in Adam and Eve's place. And so what happened is, is they committed the first sin and when they committed the first sin, it caused pain to enter in the world. Nothing works perfectly. And the thing is, is when you realize this, you'll actually be less angry and you'll be less depressed in your life. And would anybody in here want to be less angry and less dep depressed in life? I would want to be. That's all I'm saying. Because here's the deal. When you realize that we live in a fallen world, when you realize that we live in a world full of pain because of what Adam and Eve's first sin was, when you realize that, it kind of allows you to adjust your expectations for life. Like growing up, you know, you, you kind of, you grow up and you, you can kind of have these expectations of, you know, and desires of, you know, uh, you know my relationships should work perfectly. Uh, things at school should go the way uh, I think they should. Uh, my life should just work in this neat way that I plan. I don't know if you could relate to that. But when you realize that we just live in a world where nothing works perfect. We live in a world where there's pain. It will allow you to adjust your expectations, and as a result of adjusting your expectations, you'll oftentimes probably find yourself being less depressed, less angry. The second reason why we experience pain is just because of your own sin. Your own sin causes you pain. You know, oftentimes you hear people talk about, like, I want to live wild and free. I want to be able to do uh, what I want, and I want to be able to do it whenever I want. And you know, it, there's not any one right way to live life. There are many different right paths to, to living life. But the problem is, is that living wild and free isn't free. There's a cost, and the cost is consequences, because every sin that you commit has a consequence. When you don't study for a test and you never pay attention to class and you don't do anything, what's the consequence? You fail. I know this because I did that quite often. When you constantly fall into anger with somebody you're in a relationship with, consequence, you ruin the relationship. When you look at porn, what's the consequence? You easily get addicted. When you cross sexual boundaries with people you're in a relationship with before you're married, what's the consequence? You damage that relationship and future relationships that you might have. STDs, the list goes on. Every sin that you commit has a consequence, and consequences oftentimes are painful. Now, we've all experienced pain because of our own sin. We've all done something wrong, and within seconds after, been like, oh crap, what did I just do? Now I got something coming. And maybe you've been in the midst of pain that you've experienced because of something you did wrong. And maybe you've asked this question, you know, why is there even pain in the world? Like, has anybody else asked that question before? You've just been going through something really hard, going through something really tough in your life, something didn't work out, and you've just asked this question, even to God maybe, why is there pain in this world? Why do things always have to be so hard? Why do things have to be this way? Now let me say this before I answer that question. God does not enjoy your pain. When God sees you in pain, and if you're in here and maybe you're going through something right now and you feel pain, 
Can I just tell you this? God doesn't enjoy seeing you in pain. It's not something he likes. God, when he originally created the world, everything was good. There was no pain in the world. He doesn't take joy in it. The reason why there's pain in the world isn't because God created it that way. It's not because God wants it that way. It's because we've made it that way. We've made it that way through our own sin. We've dug ourselves into our own ditch. And so pain is a result of our own sin. It's not God's fault. And you know, what's interesting is what I've found when talking to people that are far from God and maybe people that aren't Christians. What I've found is pain is oftentimes the number one thing that keeps people from God. Maybe you could relate. Maybe right now you feel far from God and it's because of pain in your life. You've been experiencing pain with your family. And you've been experiencing just, just pain and it's, it's, it's kept you far from God because you're mad at Him. God, how could you let this happen to me? Why would, you, why would you let this happen to me? I am so miserable right now. But the fact is, is that God doesn't enjoy that pain. He didn't create that pain. The pain that you experience, the pain that I experience, it's not a result of God's creation. It's a result of our sin's creation. And so the question I have to ask you tonight is, have you let your pain keep you from Jesus? Has there been something that went on in your life, or maybe something that's going on right now, and it's hurting so bad on the inside, you feel the pain, are you letting that keep you from Jesus? Because here's the deal, Jesus isn't somebody to blame for your pain. He's not to blame. It's our fault. It's sin's fault. It's the result of sin. It's not the result of his will for your life. Don't let pain keep you from Jesus because you were made for a relationship with him. Here's the second consequence of the fall. Physical death. Second consequence of the fall. Physical death. God, he continues to talk to Adam about the consequences of sin. And in Genesis 3, 19, he says, By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food. You're going to have to work hard for it. Anybody else here, like, know somebody that sweats way too much, by the way? Like everybody, I feel like everybody has, like, that one dad. He just, like, sweats way too much. It's like, Dad, like, I wear at least three layers of deodorant. Like, seriously. Anyways, he said, By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food. And then he says this, until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken. For dust you are, and dust you will return. What God's saying here in Genesis 1, we see God, he takes dust from the ground, from the earth, he forms it, and then the Bible says that God breathes life into man. And the man became a living person. And what he's saying here is, Adam, because of your sin, what you came out of, you're going to go back to. You came from the dust, and one day you're going to be dead in the dust. He's essentially saying, I brought you into this world, and now because of your sin, I'm taking you out. Now let me be completely honest with you here, okay? I hate talking about death. I hate thinking about death. I have ever since I was a little kid. I remember when I was little, asking my parents all the time like, about death and, and freaking out about it and worrying about it. And My dad, uh, they're actually, my dad's family company, you know what their family uh, business is? It's a funeral home. Okay, funeral home. Okay, but you don't know what a funeral home is? is they take care of dead people and put them in coffins and all that stuff. And I remember my first encounter with death, I was five. I was maybe four, actually. I was probably four or five. I remember I was with my dad at work, and he's just, you know, hey, hang out and, you know, play with the Legos here. I remember getting up, walking around, wanting to see what my dad did. I remember having the door open and seeing my dad work on a dead lady when I was four years old. I'll never forget it. It was my first encounter with death. And I'll never forget it. It's one of my first memories in life. I remember seeing down the hallway and seeing this lady who was lifeless and thinking like, oh my gosh, that's going to happen to me one day. And just freaking out. And ever since then, I've always, 
just to be honest with you, have been, have been uh, scared about it. And, you know, we live in a culture that wants to escape physical death. Nobody likes to talk about death. People don't even call death death. They say things like, oh, well, they, they've moved on now. Or uh, they've, they've passed away. But in reality, we all know deep down, whether we think about it or acknowledge it or not, that one day, all of us that came from the dust, that God forms out of the dust, we're going back there. One day, as sad as it sounds, it's just reality. One day, we're all going to be in the ground. Or if you don't want to be in the ground, burned up into ashes or whatever. Cremation, whatever. But God didn't create death in original sin. Okay? In the original creation. Okay? It's not like God created the world and he's like, okay, I'm going to create you guys and then one day you're going to die. No. God created the world and he created life and desires life. But the consequence of sin is death. There was a time in the world where there was no death. When Adam and Eve were first created, there was no death. They were immortal. Isn't that awesome, by the way? It's pretty awesome. But sin entered the world, and as a result, there's death. Because, like I said before, sin is like you're turning your back on God and walking away from Him. And just like your phone, when you unplug it from the charger, eventually it dies. It's the same with you. Sin separates us from God. And eventually, because of that, the consequence is death. And, you know, people, you know, they, they try not to, to think about death too often. So, you know, try really hard to, like, work out and, and diet and, you know, stay busy and, you know, have fun and get a lot of money and just kind of try to make the best of life possible and to be successful and to do all these things. But in reality, that's not going to cure you. Busyness isn't going to cure you from death. You're not going to take any of your success to the grave. The only thing that can cure you from death is having a relationship with the giver of life. I'll say that again. The only thing that can cure you from the consequence of death is having a relationship with the giver of life. Because God is the person that originally created life. He desires you to have life. But unfortunately, one of the consequences of sin is physical death. Now here's the third consequence. Last consequence, and then we're going to get to the more lighter and happy stuff. So stick with me, okay? Third consequence, spiritual death. The third consequence of the fall. So it's not just a physical death, but there's spiritual death. God he talks to Adam and Eve, and in verse 23, we see something that is really, really important here. It says, So the Lord God banished him from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. So as a result of Adam and Eve's sin, he kicks them out of the Garden of Eve. Okay, what does this mean? God kicks Adam and Eve out of the Garden of Eden. What does that mean? Well, the Garden of Eden was a place where Adam and Eve were able to like literally hang out with God. Like the Bible literally says that God walked around the Garden of Eden and that they got to talk with God, have a personal relationship with God. And by the way, that's what God desires with you as well as a relationship with you. And he created it. It was a perfect relationship. And when they sin. And God kicks them out of, out of the Garden of Eden. What is essentially happening is there's a spiritual death taking place where they no longer have the kind of relationship with God that they once did. They were once close from God and now they're far from God. And what this shows us is the seriousness of sin. That spiritual death, the fact that that takes place, it shows us the seriousness of sin. That sin is so serious that it separates you from God. You know, oftentimes people talk about sin like it's like a mistake. Like, oh, like whoops, like I, I sinned. Like, it's my bad. But sin isn't a mistake. Like, think about it this way. Think about it this way. 
Okay? Just imagine with me for a second that like your parents or somebody gave you a glass vase to like put somewhere in their house. And they said, okay, be very careful with this glass vase. It is very expensive. Do not break it. Okay? And if while walking to that place, you tripped, fell on accident, and the vase shattered everywhere, versus you saying, oh, be careful with it, forget you, (laughs) throwing it on the ground and it's shattering everywhere, that's a pretty big difference, isn't it? Mistake versus jerk. Okay? You can't call sin a mistake. Because when you sin, it's not as if you're, oh, I'm tripping and oh, oh, it's broken. The nature of sin is a rebellion against God. Every time you sin, it is you knowing what God wants for you and has for you and saying, I don't care. I'm doing the opposite. I'm going to throw it on the ground and let it just, I don't care. I'm doing my own thing. That's what sin is. And that's why it's so serious. And that's why it separates us from God. And the reason that sin separates us from God is because a perfect God cannot have a relationship with imperfect people. Think of it this way. If God let a bunch of imperfect people into heaven, what would heaven be? Earth. And that would stink. Because God doesn't want a heaven that's more like hell. He wants a heaven that's like heaven. And so sin is so serious that it separates us from a perfect and holy God. So what does this mean for you? What are, what are, what are the implications for, for you? Well, since Adam and Eve, nobody else has ever been born in the Garden of Eden. Nobody has ever lived in the Garden of Eden. Eden. Meaning, nobody since Adam and Eve have had an awesome relationship with God where they literally can experience Him in a more full way, talk with Him in a more full way, walk with Him in an awesome way. Nobody is born in that state. Meaning, you weren't born having a relationship with God. You weren't born in right relationship with God. You weren't born with everything between you and God being awesome. But you were born with everything between, between you and God being not so awesome. And this is why every new generation... And every new group of people needs a new generation of church leaders. It needs a new generation of people that will stand up and share Jesus with other people. Because every time a new generation is born, you know what every new generation is? It's a new generation of people that are born far from God. It's a new generation of people born separated from God. Not headed towards heaven, but headed towards hell. And that's why every generation needs Christian leaders like you here in this room right now that's willing to say, you know what, I know that there's a whole generation of people that are my age and I am going to take it upon myself to share Jesus with them so that they can be saved from their sins and have a new life in Him. We are not born into a right relationship with God. We are born far from God. And that's why you guys have an awesome opportunity to share Jesus with other people because you guys have friends that you go to school with and family members you see on the holidays and people that surround your whole entire life that are born far from God and have never been close to Him. And it's your guys' opportunity, it's your guys' joy to be able to share the best news in the world with them so that they could have hope in life and they could have a future. But another implication of us being born separated from God is that just because you were born in a Christian family doesn't mean you're a Christian. Just because you were born growing up going to church doesn't mean you are one. Because we're all born separated from God. We're all born separated from Him because of sin. Meaning, Just because you're around Christians doesn't mean you are one. You have to, deep down in your heart, confess your sins to Jesus. Give Him your life and say, I don't want to live life my way anymore. I'm going to live life your way. 
I'm not going to do things my way. I'm going to do things your way. And so all these consequences we've been talking about today, they're pretty terrible. All right? Pain, physical death, spiritual death. Dang, Josh, thanks for church tonight. I'm about to walk up out here depressed. Well, hey, good news. Last point today. We're talking about the cure. What is the cure to the three consequences of the fall? And the cure is this. The cure is Jesus defeating Satan and sin. The cure is Jesus defeating Satan and sin. After the fall, God, he issues a punishment, not just to Adam and Eve, but he issues a punishment to the devil, right? Because the devil, he deceived Adam and Eve. And so God, he straight up throws down and he says, devil, just, just read what he says. Genesis three fifteen. God says this to the devil. He says, and I will put enmity, that's a word of just, anger or friction. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. Okay, what's going on here? He's saying I'm going to put friction between uh, Eve's kids and you're going to strike his heel, but he's going to crush your head. What is going on here? Well, the question that we should be asking here is, is who is this verse talking about? Who's the person that crushes the head of Satan? Who's the person that gets their heel striked? Let's read Hebrews 2.14. It's talking about Jesus. And it says, Since the children have flesh and blood, he too, talking about Jesus, shared in their humanity. So that by his death, he might break the power of him who holds the power of death. That is the devil. Jesus is the fulfillment of Genesis 3.15. Jesus is the person that had his heel striked but crushes the head of the devil. Jesus, he shows up on the scene and Jesus is fully God. He's fully man. He lives the perfect life that you and I never lived And when he is on the cross dying, he's not on the cross because of sins he's committed, but he's on the cross because of sins you've committed. He's on the cross because of sins that all of us have committed. And just like we've been talking about today, there are consequences for sin. And what Jesus was doing on the cross is he was saying, I love you so much that I don't want you to suffer the consequences of your sin. I'm going to suffer the consequences of your sin for you. Isn't that amazing love? Isn't that amazing love that we have a God that rather than letting us stand in our consequences and suffer our consequences, we have a God that loves you so much that he wanted to suffer the consequences that you deserved. He died so that you wouldn't have to. And it's interesting to read this passage. You know, the passage, it talks about them crushing the head of Satan. And I don't know, when I read that passage, I'm just like, yeah, that's right, devil. Like, boom, get destroyed, son. But when you like read that passage, right, you, you would think that Jesus would be somebody that like show up on the scene like a ripped superhero, Superman, roll up on the scene and be like, devil, let's go. You know, like, I don't know, beat him in a wrestling match and punch him out and then maybe like in dramatic effect. I don't know. But that's not what Jesus is at all. What does Jesus do? He lives the perfect life. He serves people like you and me. He loves people. And then he dies. How does he crush Satan's head? Is it by being strong by what our world would think and crushing people like our world would think? No, it's by him dying in your place. God, who could create the whole world by just saying stuff, became a man and died so that you wouldn't have to suffer the consequences of your sin. And when he died, he rose again three days later, and that's how he defeated death. That's how he defeated Satan, so that if you believe in him and trust in him, you don't have to suffer the consequences of your sin. Meaning, if you're in here and you're a Christian... 
You don't have to carry the shame of your sin anymore. That sin that you've been so worried about, that sin that you've been so ashamed about, that doesn't define you anymore. That's not who you are anymore. When Jesus sees you, if you are in Christ, you're a Christian, he doesn't see your sin anymore. He sees perfection. He doesn't see you as a messed up, jacked up human being. He sees the perfection of Jesus. And if you're in here and you're not a Christian, that's something that you should want. Because that's the most amazing gift ever. And so I want to close this here in just two minutes. And I want to close with asking this question. Have you been cured of the consequences? Have you been cured of the consequences of sin? If you have not been cured by the consequences, then you will receive the consequences of your sin. Sin is serious. And if you don't receive Jesus in your life, become a Christian and give Jesus your life, rather than letting what Jesus did count for you, you get to count the cost of your own consequences and experience them yourself. You know, a lot of pastors and preachers and churches today, they don't like to talk about it because it makes them all nervous and, 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 and you know, squirm around all weird and get nervous. But you know what? There is a hell. And it is real. And it is hot. And forever is a long time. And that's the consequence of sin. Spiritual death. Eternal separation from God. And if you haven't been cured by your consequences, then maybe tonight's the night you could do that. Because here's the deal. No matter who you are, you can't escape the consequences of your sin by how good you are. It doesn't matter if you've gone to church every day and every week and you're the best person ever. You don't cuss. You don't drink. You don't, you don't do drugs. You're, you're the best person ever. So what? That can't save you. You can't be good enough to cure yourself of the consequences. But also, another thing is you can't be too bad to not be cured. The cure of Christ can reach anywhere. You can never be too far from God to be cured by Him. There is no sin too bad, too dark, too ugly that cannot be forgiven. Now, if a, if a deathly sick person had a, an available cure to their sickness but didn't take advantage of that cure, they would be crazy. And it's the same with you. If you haven't been cured by your consequences of sin and you haven't given your life to Jesus and trusted Him, confessed your sins to Him, asked for a new life with Him, then I want to give you that opportunity tonight to simply just ask. If you want to be cured of all the consequences of your sin, all you have to do is ask. Just Jesus, will you please forgive me of my sin? I want to give all my life to you. It's as simple as that. Jesus did, already did all the work on the cross. He already did it all for you. All you have to do is just simply ask. And you will be forgiven. And you will be saved.